Suppose we want to find the volume of a cylinder. Well, a cylinder we could consider as a solid of revolution after all. I mean, if we take the x-axis right here and we take some type of rectangle sitting above the x-axis, uh, this the, the, the height of the rectangle we can think of as the radius of the cylinder and then the length uh, of the rectangle would be the height of the said cylinder, right? And we rotate this around the x-axis. This would form a cylindrical type object, right? We would get something that looks like the following. Uh, apologize for my crudeness there. But the height of the rectangle of the cylinder would be h, and the radius of the cylinder would likewise be r. Um, but what's the problem with this type of reasoning? Um, we can we could we certainly can do that, but when you think about it, the disk method and the washer method, although these would be disk in this context, the disk method is based upon the fact that we know how to find the volume of a cylinder, uh, pi r squared h, right? And so it would kind of be circular reasoning, uh, sorry, uh, no pun intended there, that in order to find the volume of a cylinder, we have to already know the volume of a cylinder. So if we wanted to sort of take a different perspective uh, to find the volume of a cylinder that perhaps avoids this logical problem, um, it might be useful to think of a circle, uh, sorry, to think of a cylinder instead as a stack of circles that are sitting on top of each other. Imagine like you had a long uh, tower of like pennies or coins that are sitting on top of each other. If you put these things on top of each other, you can make a cylinder. Um, and thus a cylinder is essentially, we just take the cylinder and you can slice it into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller things as well, smaller prisms, so to speak, um, where this prism, you're going to take the area of the circle, and then you're going to times it by the thickness, which in this case would be like a dx or a dy, depending on how you orient it. So uh, what I mean here is we can um, think of the cylinder as a stack of circles. That is, the cylinder is a continuum of cross-sectional areas. Um, in particular, if we subdivide the cylinder into these cross-sectional disks with uniform thickness, um, we could then calculate the we could calculate the volume of the cylinder by integrating this area times the thickness of the each of these disks as x just ranges from a to b. And if you think about that, the area of a circle is typically this pi r squared dx, right? Um, where for a cylinder, the radius doesn't change as you go from one circle to another, uh, this would then give us this value of pi h squared, uh, pi r squared h, kind of like so. And so this, this strategy of using cross-sectional slicing um, to calculate the volume of a, of a solid of any kind can be very useful. And this also allows us to move away from solids of revolution. So take a look at this picture right here, which is taken courtesy of James Stewart's calculus textbook. I think this is from the seventh edition, although it, it's, it's, it's in most of the editions of the textbook. Imagine we have some solid. You look at this picture right here. There is no rotational symmetry going on here. But the idea is whatever, whatever the shape turns out to be, we can cross-sectionally slice it, slice it, slice it, slice it in the way that we're doing right here. In which case, we then get this cross-sectional area like this. And we can think of the solid as just a continuum of all of these different cross-sectional slices. Like if we were to take uh, an apple or a banana, we just slice into little, little pieces here. The whole together forms the original solid, but we can study these cross-sectional slicings um, individually. Now imagine we could come up with a function a of x that could capture the area of each cross-sectional slice. Well, then if we took the integral of that area function with respect to the thickness dx, that would give us the volume. Now, the disk and washer method we've seen before is a specialization of this. For the disk method, your area function uh, a of x here is just pi r squared, where, uh, where the radius here is just a function of x. Well, we can approach other problems where the, the area function doesn't necessarily have to come from uh, this, rotational, this rotational consideration as well. 
And so let's look at an example of this. And yes, I'm going to look at a, a sphere in this situation. A sphere, we could find the volume um, as a solid of ro revolution where we rotate a semicircle around the x-axis. But let's try it with this cross-sectional approach, right? We could think of a sphere, much like a cylinder, a sphere is going to be a stack of circles. Uh, but the circles will change their radius dependent on where they are in the tower. Um, I've, these ones are positioned horizontally. Again, these are also images taken from uh, James Stewart's calculus textbook. And so we can try to make a prediction on what the volume of a sphere would be as thinking of these stacks, this, this, this continuum of circles. You see three approximations of the sphere in front of you right here. Um, there's an approximation with five disc, 10 disc, um, and 20 disc as well. And it will converge towards the true volume of the sphere as you get more and more and more disc. So we'll take for granted we have the volume of a cylinder, which we could do by this cross-sectional slicing like we saw on the previous slide. But if we treat this as these cross-sectional circles, these discs, what would the volume look like? The volume would look like the integral from, uh, well, the integral of ax dx, like so. And so the idea we have is the following. We start off with a circle of radius r, circle of radius r, like so. And we're going to slice this thing perpendicular to the x-axis. Let's say that the center of the circle is 0, 0. And so if we take these perpendicular slices like this, right? And so if we were to take any one of these slices and look from a different angle, it would look like a circle. Uh, but if you turn it, it would look like it's just wafer thin, right? The thickness here is just going to be a dx. So what's going to be the area of this circle? Well, the area of the circle is going to be pi r squared, but the radius of this circle depends where it is along the x-axis. So if we go along the x-axis here, well, at a specific moment uh, x, the y-coordinate up here, so you have this point x comma y, the y-coordinate is going to give us the radius of this circle. So this circle is going to have an area of pi y squared. And so we would integrate pi y squared dx like so. And then how do our x values change? We go from x equals negative r, which is the left side of the circle. And then we come over here to the right side, x equals r. And so now we have to consider how do we represent, oh, I wrote a y, an r when I meant to wrote a y earlier. So this right here should be a pi y squared, like so, um, as x ranges from negative r to capital R. How do we represent y as a function of x? Well, this is where that semicircle approach comes into play here. Um, if we think of the unit circle as x squared plus y squared, and I guess it's not the unit circle because the radius is r here. Um, if we solve for y, we're going to get the square root of r squared minus x squared, like so. We're going to insert that in for y squared. And if you're worried that having a square root is going to make the antiderivative difficult, well, we're squaring the square root. Um, so that's going to disappear, giving us the integral from negative r to r. We get pi times r squared minus x squared dx. And this is the thing that we're going to try to integrate. Uh, now, for the sake of symmetry, because, I mean, a sphere is symmetrical, right? If we take the y-axis as this line of symmetry right here, um, the volume of one side is equal to the volume of the other. So using that symmetry, we can actually rewrite this integral as 2 pi, I brought the pi out, the integral from 0 to r of r squared minus x squared dx. Like so. Basically, we're using the fact that we're integrating a symmet uh, an even function along a symmetric integral, uh, interval. Um, and so if we integrate this, the integral of r squared with respect to x is just going to be an r squared x because we're treating r squared as a constant. The antiderivative of negative x squared with respect to x will be negative x cubed over 3 as we go from 0 to r. Plug it in the r there, we get 2 pi. We're going to get an r cubed minus r cubed over 3. Um, factor out the common factor of r cubed, we get 2 pi r cubed and we're left behind a 1 minus a third. 1 minus a third is 2 thirds, and this then gives us the standard formula, 4, uh, four thirds pi r cubed, 
which is again the standard formula for a sphere, uh, which we can use. We can we found this formula using this idea of cross-sectional slicing. It's pretty neat, isn't it?